right, well, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. Just a reminder to please keep yourself on mute so that there aren't any distractions during the presentation. Uh, I will be recording the, pres the lecture and I will email it to everybody after tonight so that you have it for future reference. So also, if you have any questions during, please type them in the chat box at the bottom of the screen and Dr. Fuchs will answer them at the end. I'll send a message in there and when we begin, so you can see where it is. So tonight's lecture will be given by Dr. Daniel Fuchs and just a little bit about him. Dr. Fuchs is an orthopedic surgeon specializing in the treatment of foot and ankle disorders. He completed his residency in orthopedic surgery at McGaw Medical Center at Northwestern University and went on to complete a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery at Baylor University Medical Center. He treats all foot and ankle conditions and has particular interest in bunions, hammer toes, acute fractures of the foot and ankle, sports-related injuries, foot and ankle arthritis, diabetic foot conditions, ankle arthroscopy, complex deformity, and total ankle replacement. He sees patients at our Willow Grove, Chalfont, Newtown, and Ben Salem offices. So go ahead, Dr. Fuchs. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much, and thank you all for, uh, for attending the virtual uh, lecture here. Um, as Natalie said, we'll be speaking on treatment options for common conditions of the foot and ankle. Um, and she uh, pretty much went through all this for me, so thank you. Um, so again, my scope of practice is trying to you know, treat everything related to the foot and ankle, and, and that can be broadly grouped into uh, these categories, including arthritis, uh, uh, tendinopathies or tendon-related conditions, uh, deformities, both of the forefoot, uh, midfoot, and as well as the ankle, um, fractures uh, throughout the foot and ankle, as well as uh, various soft tissue conditions. Um, so these are some of the common conditions that we treat, and we'll try to touch on uh, on all of these um, items today. Uh, while it's not an exhaustive list, it should give a pretty good overview of uh, many of the, the conditions that we, that we see in the office frequently. So just to start things off, uh, ankle sprains are really one of the most commonly treated orthopedic conditions overall. Um, and uh, a sprain does involve uh, an injury to, uh, to a ligament and uh, at least a partial or sometimes a complete ligament tear. Um, an ankle sprain most commonly will occur from an inversion type mechanism, so rolling the ankle inwards. And as a result, uh, it tends to be the ligaments on the outside of the ankle that are torn. Uh, most commonly, this is the anterior uh, talofibular ligament, uh, which is seen here and then followed by the calcaneofibular ligament. Uh, and there's really a, a broad and wide, um, uh, sever wide variation in the severity of injuries. Uh, and this can include the number of ligaments uh, involved and uh, partial versus complete disruption. So many minor sprains uh, can be you know, uh, treated uh, uh, by oneself and, and usually don't make their way into our office, whereas uh, more severe sprains can be difficult to differentiate uh, from a fracture without getting x-rays and, and come in quite swollen. Um, and uh, especially for these more severe injuries, inadequate treatment can, can lead to repeated sprains and chronic instability, um, and then sometimes development of uh, arthritis of the ankle. Sorry, I need to activate the light here. Um, so some of the symptoms and uh, uh, pr presentation of ankle sprain include pain, swelling, bruising, feelings of instability, and uh, having trouble bearing weight. So the treatment um, is initially nearly always non-surgical. There's not really much of a role for uh, acute surgery for, uh, for an ankle uh, sprain right off the bat. Um, and general principles are rest and rehabilitation. So most of the sprains that you know, come in to, to see me are on the more severe side, and therefore I typically treat most in a, in a boot for a short period of time, uh, usually one to two weeks. And then you know, have patients transition into an ankle brace um, once the swelling and pain uh, have resolved to some extent. I often uh, will refer them to physical therapy for some focused exercises, working on stretching out the ankle and also uh, strengthening uh, the muscles that help dynamically stabilize the ankle and doing proprioceptive training um, uh, to help in the overall recovery. So surgery is really reserved for uh, the small subset of patients uh, who have persistent or recurrent in instability. They have multiple ankle sprains um, over a period of time or, or don't get better from an ankle sprain. Uh, this can occur up, up to 15% of patients. That's probably a high estimate just based on one study, um, uh, but uh, we, do, we do see this. Um, and there's a number of different techniques to repair or reinforce the ligaments, but essentially what we're doing is uh, taking the stretched out ligament and, and tightening it up and making it stronger. Um, and 
you know, my practice, I do incorporate, you know, some um, newer technology, including uh, what's called an internal brace, which is just a heavy uh, suture tape that uh, reinforces the repair and allows, uh, in some cases, for an accelerated rehabilitation and uh, hopefully decreased uh, risk of uh, repeat injuries. So moving on to another extremely uh, common condition that we see, uh, plantar fasciitis, which is more of a, uh, a chronic um, a recurrent condition. Uh, and typically this is characterized by pain right on the bottom of the heel and it uh, occurs from degeneration of the plantar fascia, which is a strong ligament uh, that connects the calcaneus uh, to the toes. Um, you know, uh, an estimated more than 2 million patients per year receive treatment for this, so we're seeing it in the office all the time. Um, and it's uh, more common to get the pain right at the heel where that plantar fascia inserts on it rather than uh, along the arch of the foot, the mid substance of the ligament. But uh, symptoms are commonly occur with first steps in the morning and then with prolonged standing or with uh, walking or impact activity. And uh, while the um, structural issue with the plantar fasciitis is not, um, is not a severe one. The pain can be very severe, and people describe, you know, the sensation of a of an ice pick being driven into their heel. So it can be quite painful. Um, notably, uh, patients may have a bone spur at their heel, uh, but this has been uh, shown very well to not be the actual cause of the pain. So another condition uh, that uh, the treatment is mainly non-surgical. Um, you know, this is usually a self-limiting condition um, and it can take a while to go away and can be recurrent, but, uh, but almost always gets better on its own. So, you know, the, the treatments that we recommend are, are initially stretching and uh, that includes both the calf and the plantar fascia. Uh, recommend ice and massage, uh, avoiding any barefoot walking, using soft cushion heel pads. There's no real role for custom orthotics and, and a period of rest. Uh, I reserve a corticosteroid injection as a second line treatment as well as formal physical therapy. And then la uh, surgery is really last resort and uh, reserved for a uh, minimum of one year of symptoms. That can involve releasing a part of the plantar fascia, releasing a nerve that runs along that area that can be compressed, and sometimes lengthening the calf if it's still tight at that point. Then there are some newer technologies. Um, you know, TenJet or TenX, which is a percutaneous needle tenotomy uh, that um, there's not great evidence for so far, and I don't uh, do it personally, but we do have um, others in the practice that uh, do offer that as, uh, as an alternative to surgery. So moving on to uh, Achilles uh, conditions and Achilles tendinopathy. This uh, occurs when there's degeneration of the Achilles tendon uh, and often with overuse. Um, there's a two different areas where this can uh, manifest itself, either right at the insertion on the calcaneus or the heel bone or several centimeters above. And these are uh, referred to as insertional or non-insertional Achilles tendinopathy. Um, and uh, this is also thought to be related to uh, tightness of the tendon as well as the uh, muscle unit that it's attached to. The gastrocnemius and the soleus are the two muscles that attach to the Achilles. Uh, patients have uh, pain that occurs with increased activity uh, or from walking after a period of immobility, uh, getting up in the morning or getting out of the car and walking. There can be thickening of the tendon itself and also swelling and inflammation of the soft tissue surrounding the tendon or peritoneum uh, uh, inflammation. And uh, an insertional Achilles tendinopathy uh, is typically accompanied by a, a bone spur at the Achilles insertion. And in, in this case, that bone spur uh, can be part of the uh, pain producing uh, cause. Initial treatment, again, is, uh, is non-surgical, and, and we're noticing a theme here, but immobilization in a, in a boot is often very effective, especially if uh, patients are having difficulty walking. Uh, ice and anti-inflammatories and calf stretching exercises. Physical therapy has been uh, shown to be very effective for this condition, and there's a specific protocol called Albertson's Protocol, which involves uh, the calf um, stretching and strengthening at the same time by dropping your heel down below, below a stair, as is pictured in, in this image. Um, also, using a small heel lift in the shoe uh, can take some of the tension off the Achilles and relieve uh, some, of this, some of the symptoms and, and is a relatively simple treatment. However, some patients don't respond to the non-surgical treatment and, and for those, um, you know, surgery is indicated and, and this is more commonly done than the, uh, than the plantar fascia surgery, certainly. Um, it's a combination of things that are typically done and, uh, and are tailored to each individual patient, but usually what's involved is removing or detaching uh, part or all of the Achilles tendon, removing the bone spurs, um, as you can, which as you can see here can have multiple different parts uh, and become very large, uh, removing the diseased or torn portion of the tendon and then reattaching the tendon down into the heel bone. 
Uh, if a significant portion or greater than 50% of the tendon is compromised, sometimes we'll even have to add an additional tendon transfer uh, from the tendon from the big toe into the heel bone as well to make the repair stronger. Moving on to some uh, forefoot uh, pathology, uh, bunion, another um, very common condition, uh, refers to a bony prominence at the um, inner aspect of the first metatarsophalangeal joint, so where the great toe or the big toe meets the foot. And uh, bunion is derived from a Greek word for a turnip, as you can see the picture. Um, this is usually a progressive deformity. It, it gradually gets worse with time, although uh, some you know, children and adolescents uh, uh, do have this uh, from a young age. Um, it causes the great toe to deviate towards the second toe or into valgus and can put pressure between the great toe and the second toe. Uh, patients sorry, um, can get uh, irritation of the skin overlying the bunion. Um, they can get redness, swelling, and, and have significant pain there, particularly with shoe wear. Um, pain can initially be intermittent, but can become persistent, and it can also be accompanied by restriction of, of movement of the great toe over time as the deformity gets worse. There's also a sensory nerve that runs in this area that gets irritated and can contribute substantially to the, to the symptoms. So a lot of people want to know why, you know, why, why they have a bunion or where it comes from, and it's likely a combination of factors. Um, you know, I think that there's a, a very significant genetic uh, or hereditary component. While there's not one single bunion gene, they do tend to run significantly in families. Uh, there may be some, some trauma or overuse or microtrauma that occurs, and shoe wear likely does play a role. Um, as as uh, imaged by this, uh, by this picture here showing how uh, shoes can affect the position uh, that the foot is taking. Uh, patients with an inflammatory arthropathy, such as rheumatoid arthritis, can get a, a version of bunions uh, that, that also look similar. So initial treatment is non-operative, though, you know, this sometimes is not the, the most effective. Really, the, the non-operative treatment is to find comfortable shoes or, or adjust your shoes to fit, to fit the shape of your foot. Uh, so you're looking for a wide uh, and high toe box. Uh, you want to avoid high heels because that puts a lot of pressure on the forefoot. Um, you can consider use of a toe spacer or, or different braces and splints. Now, you know, when, uh, when addressing these braces and splints, there's a, there's a big market and big industry of people trying to sell these items, and uh, none of them, you know, are going to reverse the, the deformity that's present. And there's even question whether they'll prevent uh, progression. Uh, so they should be just worn for, for comfort. It's not something that's useful to wear at night to, to try to get a correction. It's something that's more of a supportive device to, to make you comfortable walking. So when to consider surgery? You know, patients with a bad deformity, persistent pain, inability to find any comfortable shoe wear, um, and, and people have tried and, and failed non-surgical treatments, uh, and that can just include trying to find comfortable shoes, really. Um, it's important to note that this should not be for cosmetic, cosmetic or preventive purposes. The indication for surgery really is, is pain and inability to find comfortable shoe wear. So the surgical treatment, uh, you know, sometimes is a little more complex than many people realize uh, because simply uh, shaving the bump or removing the bump doesn't correct the underlying deformity and, and really just doesn't work well. Um, the appropriate treatment is usually uh, involves multiple different components and often involves uh, cutting that first metatarsal, uh, the bone that is in the foot that's connected to the big toe, and shifting it over, as well as shaving the bump down. We also do a, a realignment or rebalancing of the soft tissues of that great toe joint. Uh, and in very severe cases, or cases with some associated arthritis, sometimes a, a fusion of that big toe joint is, is the most uh, effective treatment. In terms of the post-operative recovery, it, it varies a little bit depending on the type of bunion procedure that you have done um, and from patient to patient. But you know, uh, for me, it usually involves use of a special post-operative hard-soled sandal with uh, heel weight-bearing only initially. And uh, for an isolated bunion, can start to transition into some normal shoe wear between 9 and 12 weeks and, uh, and relax any activity restrictions by, by three months. But uh, since we are cutting and, and moving bone, it, you do have to allow some time for that bone to heal before ramping up uh, the level of activity. So uh, a related condition is uh, great toe arthritis, also referred to as hallux rigidus. And in this condition, you start to have actually arthritic changes at, the, uh, at that same joint, the great toe MTP joint, our first MTP joint. Um, 
Arthritic changes can manifest themselves as cartilage loss in addition to the formation of bone spurs. So two different things that you see radiographically, a narrowing of the joint space and production of, of bone spurs that are often most notable at the top of the toe area. And the pain occurs from the bone on bone contact of the joint as well as from impingement of, of the bone spurs and pressure from shoes. Um, patient can experience the pain deep within the joint uh, due to the cartilage loss and, and then on the top of the, uh, top of the foot due to uh, shoe wear and activity. So initial uh, treatment includes non-operative treatment with uh, shoe wear modification. In this case, what you're looking for is a, is a good stiff sole shoe, and, and this Hoka is, a, is an example of that, uh, also with a high toe box to allow room for that bone spur and a soft upper portion that doesn't put a lot of pressure on the area. You can place a carbon fiber plate, uh, which is a thin metal plate, into the shoe to artificially stiffen it. Um, and then activity modification and anti-inflammatory, similar to treatment of other forms of arthritis. So looking at the surgery, uh, surgical options, there's, there's really three main options. There's the uh, chylectomy, uh, which is uh, imaged here at the top picture, which involves, and this is a before and after, which involves a removal of the bone spur. So chylectomy refers to removal of the bone spur, and we do a joint debridement, basically removing any uh, loose tissue or, or flaps of cartilage that may be uh, contributing to the symptoms. This is for more you know, mild to mild to moderate cases. Uh, the first MTP fusion, or an arthrodesis is the, is the technical term for that, is for more advanced cases. And, and what's done there is actually we remove any remaining cartilage, um, of which there's often very little, and uh, place either screws or a plate and screws to hold the joint stabilized while your body fills it in with solid bone. So basically get rid of the joint completely in order to, uh, to, to cure the pain. The last thing I'll mention is an inner position arthroplasty, and there's some different ways to do that where you put some type of material within the joint. Um, this is only for a small you know, percentage of patients. Most people will either get the chylectomy or the fusion. And for a while, we were using this device called the Cartiva, uh, which was a little plug uh, to, uh, to serve as an inner position. Uh, the initial um, studies on this were very encouraging, however, uh, in practice, uh, people's results have been um, more inconsistent and hit or miss. So I've kind of gone away from offering that as a, uh, as a treatment option at this time. So going to the lesser toes um, and away from the gray toe, uh, hammer toes often go along with um, you know, uh, more bunions, but sometimes with, uh, with a, a big toe arthritis as well. And that refers to a contracture deformity of the lesser toes. Um, in earlier stages, it can be a flexible deformity, meaning you can straighten out the toe uh, with, um, uh, manually, uh, but it, you know, over time, it can become rigid where, you, where it's impossible to straighten it uh, by just uh, attempting to use your hand and straighten it out. Uh, patients get symptoms from, uh, <clears throat> from pain and irritation from shoe wear at the top of the toe. They can develop calluses and corns over bony prominences, and you, they can have inflammation and redness and a burning sensation. Um, they can be caused by, again, a number of different factors. It can be an injury to the toe. It can be from tight shoes or heels, uh, from pressure from the bunion, causing the toe to uh, curl up and, and become a hammer toe and imbalance of the muscles, uh, tendons, and ligaments that keep the toe straight. Uh, initial treatment is uh, you know, providing uh, padding or, um, or cushion to the toes, uh, finding shoe wear that are wider and deeper uh, shoe boxes, as well as trying to strap or, or splint the toes down, um, and then finally surgery. So these are some examples of the non-surgical treatment and a picture of the, uh, you know, what a hammer toe looks like. Uh, this is just a little silicone sleeve that goes over the toe to protect bony prominences. And this is an example of a, a type of strap to hold the toe down and prevent it from pressing against the shoes. This tends to be more effective when the deformity is more flexible earlier on than, than when it becomes rigid. So when, ad when uh, addressing hammer toes surgically, there's a number of different components of the procedure. It involves releasing the soft tissue structures that are, that are holding the, um, the toe contracted. That includes tendons and ligaments. Um, and typically when they get to, to needing surgery, they are at least uh, somewhat um, inflexible, meaning that they can't be uh, easily corrected. So um, what's involved is usually removing a portion of the bone from the proximal interphalangeal joint uh, in order to straighten out that joint and then placing pins across the joint uh, that typically stay in place for approximately uh, six weeks or at least four weeks. 
in, uh, in the case of, uh, of bad deformity, sometimes we have to shorten the metatarsal bone a little bit in order to allow the toe to fall back into place. And we also take care to repair ligaments and transfer tendons as needed to balance out the soft tissues so that uh, everything remains well aligned. Now moving to the hind foot and, um, and a condition called posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, which is associated with a, with a flat foot or pes planus. So a flat foot in, in isolation is not in itself problematic and are often asymptomatic. However, uh, adults with a, with a flat foot can become symptomatic over time as the deformity progresses and they start to put stress along the posterior tibial tendon, which can become degenerative, stretch out, and eventually tear. And this can cause the, the arch to further, uh, further flatten. And again, this process is termed posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. Patients will get pain initially along the tendon and then into the arch of the foot as the arch collapses. Um, and then as things become more severe, they can even get pain on the outer portion of the foot from impingement of the soft tissue structures there. And then eventually at the ankle. Um, uh, ultimately patients can, uh, but not always develop uh, a component of arthritis where this deformity becomes, becomes stiffer and painful at the joints themselves. So initial treatment again is non-surgical. Um, if patients are acutely uh, in pain and, diff and having difficulty ambulating for a short period of time, I may put them into a walking boot and then have them transition to uh, a lace-up ankle brace and try some physical therapy. Therapy usually involves stretching out the calf, which gets tight with this, and doing stretching and strengthening exercise of the posterior tibial tendon. Um, our orthotics are helpful for this, and uh, what they do is try to realign uh, the, the hind foot and take the pressure off that posterior tibial tendon. Ultimately, if this becomes a chronic condition, uh, the best non-surgical treatment is really to use a custom molded brace, and an Arizona brace is an example of that, which I'll show. So these are to try to uh, illustrate what some of these devices are. This is the cam boot or fracture boot that's typically just used for a temporary period of time. Uh, uh, or uh, acute symptoms of, of pain. Uh, this is a lace-up ankle brace, which is uh, somewhat low profile, uh, athletic style brace uh, for uh, patients with more mild uh, symptoms or more uh, recent symptoms. And then this is more the Arizona brace, which is uh, a bit bulkier, but custom molded and more effective at holding the ankle and hind foot in the appropriate position. So surgery um, is a, an involved process for this condition, and it's multifactorial. Uh, usually when, when patients uh, get to the point of surgery, they have um, a contracture of their, of their calf muscle. So uh, one of the first things we'll usually do is to, is to lengthen that to help us correct the deformity. Then we will cut the heel bone or the calcaneus and shift it over, uh, remove that torn posterior tibial tendon and actually replace it with the tendon, the flexor digitorum longus, which is the flexor tendon to the toes uh, that hooks up in its place. Um, for uh, more severe uh, deformities, we'll also lengthen the outer portion of the foot. So do a calcaneal osteotomy that lengthens the outer portion and then sometimes have to even add an additional bone cut through the uh, middle of the arch of the foot called a cotton osteotomy to try to uh, create or enhance the arch. This is an example of a patient who uh, basically had all of those um, procedures done in the, the before and after pictures where they really had uh, almost a, a negative arch or, or no arch and, and then uh, that was restored with a combination again of the uh, tendon transfers um, and bone cuts or osteotomies. A triple arthrodesis is another surgical option uh, for patients who have a rigid deformity that doesn't passively correct. Um, so the osteotomies and bone cuts are only effective if the, if the deformity is flexible. In the cases that it becomes rigid or the joints become arthritic, then we have to actually do a fusion of the affected joints, which are the uh, subtalar, talonavicular, and calcaneocuboid joint in the appropriate position. Moving further up the leg to the ankle now, uh, ankle arthritis um, uh, is a uh, condition where patients have pain uh, along the deep within the ankle and in the front of the ankle, they may experience pain or cracking or, or crepitus. Uh, they can have the sensation that something's getting stuck in the ankle. Uh, pain typically occurs with walking or standing. Often um, uh, any arthritic pain uh, is often accompanied by what we call startup pain, where when you first start walking, you have a, a pain in the joint, and then it does get somewhat better sometimes as you, as you get moving. Um, uh, they tend to be better with rest and, and do have associated stiffness as things progress. 
So interestingly, the main cause of ankle arthritis is, is post-traumatic, either from a, a severe um, injury to the, uh, to the ankle joint or an ankle fracture, or from a number of uh, uh, smaller uh, repeated ankle sprains. There, there can be a genetic or hereditary component. Um, uh, there can be inflammatory arthropathy, such as rheumatoid arthritis, and it can be degenerative. But you know, as opposed to knee and hip arthritis, which is commonly a, a degenerative thing, ankle arthritis is, is um, largely uh, or most commonly related to trauma. So the non-surgical treatments um, involve uh, typical treatments for arthritis in general. So lower impact uh, activity with activity modification using anti-inflammatories, either orally or topically. Um, uh, consideration of corticosteroid in injections into the joint um, or uh, bracing. Uh, and again, those, all those options that were listed before, such as the athletic uh, lace-up brace, the Arizona brace, in addition to some of these larger brace, which is a, a custom hinge brace or a, a solid custom AFO brace are options for uh, treatment of the ankle arthritis. Uh, physical therapy may or may not you know, provide significant, um, significant benefit uh, you know, for these patients. So moving on to the surgical options, there's really two, and ankle fusion is still um, the, the gold standard in the established uh, treatment for ankle arthritis. And, and what's done similar to the, the big toe fusion is to remove any remaining cartilage, uh, align the joint in the proper orientation and hold it steady with, uh, with screws uh, or platen screws while your body fills the, fills the area in with bone and, and basically eliminates the joint. And it's very good at pain relief, uh, but obviously the trade-off is, is loss of range of motion. Uh, so some patients start without very much range of motion and may not miss it with an ankle fusion, but some patients with ankle arthritis do have uh, good motion still and, uh, and may, uh, you know, may miss the motion uh, that's uh, when you have an ankle fusion. This tends to be a, a better option for younger patients because there's no concern about parts wearing out over time and it can withstand higher impact activity than, uh, than the alternative. Uh, which is an ankle replacement. So again, you know, consider it for more for patients who are looking to do higher level activity, no concern for breakdown of parts. Um, uh, one downside would be that as you fuse any individual joint, it tends to put more pressure or more stress through the joints above and below and can cause arthritis to develop in those joints. So uh, as I mentioned, the alternative to an ankle fusion is an ankle replacement. And in that, similar to a hip or knee replacement, you remove <clears throat> basically the ankle joint and replace it with metal and plastic uh, components. It allows uh, the patient to maintain their range of motion and is gaining popularity. So these were initially developed in the 1970s, so they're a bit newer than hip and knee replacements. And there's been a, several different iterations, but we're currently basically in the third generation of implants and, and the results really uh, continue to improve in terms of the longevity of these um, and the long-term outcomes. Um, since the implants are relatively uh, newer, we, we really don't know what the, uh, the long-term outcomes are, but uh, based on um, early results, they, they continue to improve as, uh, as these um, implants become more uh, sophisticated and more evolved. That being said, there are limitations to the, to the ankle replacement. It's really recommended for lower impact activity. It's good for, for walking and normal daily activities. It's not good for running or heavy lifting or um, manual labor. Um, the concern is that over time, moving parts can wear out and uh, require additional surgery, uh, either uh, for a, a small uh, touch-up procedure or for a full revision surgery. Now, you can go back and do a fusion after the replacement. However, it does um, add significantly, significantly to the complexity if you have to uh, remove an, an existing uh, replacement. So uh, moving on to another kind of separate part of, uh, of my practice and practice of a foot and ankle surgeon is, is fractures. All the things we, we mentioned were more um, elective uh, uh, related procedures, uh, but a large part of our practice uh, is dealing and, and treating patients with, uh, with fractures. And these involve fractures of the ankle, uh, of the weight bearing surfaces of the tibia, often referred to as pilon fractures or higher energy injuries, fractures of the talus, calcaneus or heel bone, midfoot injuries, uh, such as Liz Bronk injuries, and then metatarsal and toe fractures. So again, most fractures really don't require surgery. This is an example of a patient with a um, minimally displaced uh, fibula fracture treated with a boot and, and then recommendations on calcium and vitamin D that, uh, that go on to heal uh, without uh, needing any surgical intervention. Um, 
and you know fractures that don't require surgery are typically those that are non-displaced or minimally displaced most avulsion fractures if if, uh, if you're told that you have an avulsion fracture that that typically does not require surgery most metatarsal fractures really don't require surgery and, and nearly all toe fractures uh, with some exceptions uh, you know rarely require um, surgical intervention these are all uh, images of, of fractures that uh, that would go on to keep go on to heal well without any surgical intervention However, um, you know, uh, we see enough of these that we do see plenty of patients who uh, have bad enough injuries that, that we do have to intervene and do have to do surgery. So some factors that would push us more to, uh, to a surgical treatment would be uh, significantly displaced fracture, fractures of the ankle that involve two or more of the supporting structures. So uh, we call the, the structures malleoli, and there's the lateral, medial, and posterior malleoli. Uh, so if you have a bimalleolar, which indicates two malleolar fractured or trimalleolar fracture, those are often unstable and will recommend surgical treatment in order to allow the fracture to heal reliably. Anything involving the weight-bearing portion of the ankle with, uh, with any displacement, a displaced talus fracture, a significantly displaced calcaneus fracture, uh, midfoot injury or a Liz Frank injury are often unstable and require surgery. And then when there's a case of multiple displaced metatarsal fractures, we'll tend to, to do surgery. And these are all some examples of, uh, of clearly uh, unstable injuries that, that certainly require surgery in order to uh, restore function and allow the fractures to heal well. So in terms of uh, take home points, um, you know, we treat various injuries, deformities and degenerative conditions about the foot and ankle that can cause um, dysfunction and decrease quality of life. However, most, especially chronic conditions, should be initially treated with non-surgical uh, methods, uh, usually immobilization and, and some form of rehabilitation. Um, surgery is, is rarely required for these conditions, however, should definitely be considered as an option if, if the other non-surgical solutions are ineffective in order to restore quality of life. And, uh, and again, surgery should be done to improve pain and function. It shouldn't be done for cosmetic appearance, and in most cases, shouldn't be done to prevent problems in the future. And for acute fracture dislocation, uh, surgery is often the best option uh, if there is significant displacement or significant instability. And again, this was highlighted in the beginning of the lecture, but these are the places where I uh, see patients, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Dr. Fuchs. So we do have some great questions. Um, I can read them out loud, or if you want to go to the chat box and, and go through them. Yeah, let me see if I can pull that up. All right, I'll start, start from the top here. Yeah, do you see the first one is from Dennis Stiles? Is that your first? Yep, I see that. So uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it out. Um, I'm a 73-year-old male with uh, severe flat, fo flat foot and foot arthritis. Walking is very painful. I use orthotics and they help somewhat, but I've not found any that relieve all the pain. I tried the Arizona boot and that did not help. At my age, is a foot fusion ill-advised? What would the success rate be for such a surgery for me? So it sounds like uh, you've had good, you know, good non-surgical treatment so far. Uh, like I said, the Arizona brace usually is Kind of one of the more uh, substantial and supportive devices, uh, but often it's difficult to tolerate because of the bulk. Um, so I, I don't think you know age, age of 73 alone uh, precludes you from having uh, having a fusion surgery. Sorry. Um, but it kind of you know depends on. Um, you know, on each individual patient, their level of function. You know, one of the difficult things about having a fusion surgery is, is the recovery and having to be non-weight bearing, usually for about a six week period of time. Um, but if you're able to arrange your life and get the appropriate help and, um, and, and prepare for that, uh, I do not think that, you know, 73 years old um, alone, you know, precludes you from, from something like that. As far as the success rate, um, you know, again, every every fusion is different. I have to see what the what the details of your uh, particular situation are. Uh, but in general, you know, I would say um, upwards of 80 to 90 percent uh, success of, of significantly improving symptoms. You know, in most cases, we don't make things completely normal. But if you're having you know severe pain and have, have been through all these uh, different treatments without um, without good relief, uh, it often is very helpful, and people are very satisfied. Um, we'll go to the next one. I have numbness on the inside of my left ankle. I feel it on and off during the day. It really bothers me at night when I sleep. I get some tingling in, in the toes of both feet, also when I try to sleep. 
It does not bother me when I run. Any recommendations? Thank you. So this is a difficult thing that um, that unfortunately often you know is put in the ankle surgeons. We don't always have uh, have a great answer for uh, for numbness, and oftentimes it's not really originating from uh, from a structural issue of the foot and ankle. It can be from a global peripheral neuropathy. It can be from a pinched nerve in the back. Um, on rare cases, it can. You can have something called the tarsal tunnel syndrome, where the, the nerve can be entrapped uh, around the ankle. Uh, but those cases are, are, more, are more rare. So, you know, unfortunately, I would have to, you know, get some more information and, um, you know, in order to be able to give great recommendations on that because uh, it's more about identifying uh, the cause of the numbness or tingling, which is, you know, which is a little bit difficult to, to tell just from, just from this information. All right, Kathy, uh, you did my ankle fusion about two years ago and it is great. My other ankle is now giving out on me. It seems that it cannot hold my leg. I have knee, ankle, and now neck slash back replacements and wonder if now this ankle needs to be replaced. <laughs> Thanks. So hi, Kathy, I'm glad you're doing well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like, uh, um, and, not, and I don't wanna divulge any information, but, uh, you know, you obviously have arthritis of uh, a number of different joints, and it's quite possible that uh, you have some arthritis in uh, in this ankle uh, that you're referring to now. Um, depending on um, you know the the condition of the ankle and uh, any associated deformity, uh, an ankle replacement and or an ankle fusion uh, may may be options for you. Uh, so again, it'd be something I'd want to. Uh, take a closer look at it in person, see, uh, see some imaging, um, but uh, both an ankle fusion or, or an ankle replacement would be uh, potentially feasible options depending on uh, how things look. All right, uh, is Achilles tendinopathy a result of plantar fasciitis or are they totally unrelated uh, conditions? Um, so, I would say that uh, they are unrelated conditions. One does not necessarily cause another, though as I <clears throat> mentioned, alluded to in the, in, the, uh, in the lecture, they are both related to uh, a tight calf. Um, so I'm not surprised that, uh, that you could have, have both of them, um, but, uh, you know, but for the most part, uh, we don't see patients have both at the same time, um, and one does not necessarily cause another, but they're both, you know, the good news is they're both related to a, a tight calf muscle, and uh, so my you know, top recommendation for that would be to really focus on the calf stretching exercises, um, and, and that should help, uh, help alleviate both, uh, both problems. All right. Doctor, the bone on the side of my right uh, big toe is bigger than my left foot and has been for years. Do I have something to be concerned about? Thanks. Um, so this could be one of, um, you know, one of two possible things that we talked about. It could be either the bunion or hallux valgus if the enlargement is seen uh, really at the inner portion or, or the medial side of the foot, or it may be um, an issue of arthritis or hallux rigidus, um, which often is seen with as I described, bone spurs at the top of the toe. So it kind of de depends where the enlargement is. Um, and uh, either way, it's nothing to, I would say, be worried about. Um, and if you're not having pain, it's likely not a, um, you know, not anything that, that necessarily needs formal treatment. Uh, that being said, if there is pain associated with it, we do have options, and uh, and it certainly uh, wouldn't hurt to um, to check an X-ray and uh, and try to get a little definitive answer, at least uh, as to what's causing the enlargement. All right. In an individual who has both a bunion, uh, the great toe, and a bone spur on the third metatarsal on the same foot, would you recommend a simul simultaneous surgery to correct the bunion and remove the spur? Um, yeah, in short, if you have uh, two issues of, you know, either the great toe and the, and the lesser toes, um, those are things that I would routinely uh, treat um, at the same time. And that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I wouldn't really have any, any hesitation uh, with that if, if they were both symptomatic. Um, usually if patients have something with their forefoot and then with their ankle and hind foot or have something on either side, those are the cases where my general tendency would be to do more of a staged um, approach. Uh, you don't want to have both feet operated on at once if you can avoid it because you want a good leg to walk on. 
And then when you're doing surgery at multiple levels of the foot, sometimes that can um, increase the complexity and increase the, the rates of complications. So I, I do uh, sometimes stay away from that. But uh, two issues of the forefoot um, usually are, are fine to do at, at once. What type of osteotomy is used to, to surgically correct bunions, or does it depend on each patient's presentation? So, um, so that's a um, that's a good question, and there are there are numerous different types of osteotomies. The one that I mainly do, and the uh, one that was shown in, in one or two of the pictures, is called a scarf osteotomy, which is kind of a Z oriented cut uh, that allows for rotation, and it's a very stable osteotomy. Um, I do do <coughs> um, other uh, other variations too, such as a chevron for more mild uh, bunions. And then I do different types of uh, fusion too for more, more severe cases. So, um, you know, it, it does depend on, on each individual patient. It also depends on each surgeon. Certain surgeons uh, have a preference for one type of uh, osteotomy or bone cut over another. And uh, there's not really one option that's been shown to be um, the superior one and better than all the others. All right. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on Voltaren for arthritis pain? Um, you know, anti-inflammatories in general are very effective at treating arthritis, and uh, Voltaren, I'm not sure if it's referring to, um, uh, to oral or, or tablets uh, versus uh, the gel, uh, but uh, patients uh, do, get, uh, do get relief from both. Um, at least uh, if you're taking, uh, taking the Voltaren orally, it's something uh, that you want to check with your primary doctor if you're going to be on for a prolonged period of time because it can have an effect on the kidneys and, and should be monitored. Are you seeing good results for, with PRP injections uh, for soft tissue injury in the foot or ankle? Uh, so, you know, I think there is a role for PRP injections. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, the um, anecdotally, you know, I have seen some, some positive results uh, from this. It's certainly not um, a 100% and uh, really no treatment is. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of great data on uh, doing, using PRP for specific indications. And for that reason, it's uh, it's typically um, it's typically not covered uh, by insurance, so it's an out-of-pocket expense, and therefore not something that most patients uh, elect for. But I think there is a role for it uh, for uh, for different soft tissue injuries, in particular if you're trying to postpone or, or hold off on on surgery. What are your thoughts on improving big toe mobility to reduce pain and injury uh, in the foot and ankle? Um, you know, I'm not, you know, in terms of, you know, it's hard to know exactly what we're getting at with this question, but, um, you know, as far as uh, big toe mobility, if you have decreased mobility, it's likely due to some type of injury to the, to the great toe or arthritic changes. Um, and, and typically the treatments for that, you know, don't necessarily increase the mobility. Um, they more are, are geared towards uh, improving the pain. Uh, and as far as whether the decreased mobility in the big toe affects the rest of the foot and ankle, I think that's possible to some extent, but I think um, it's not a, a substantial issue because, you know, we see plenty of patients with, um, you know, who get you know, who receive a, a great toe fusion, um, you know, for either a severe bunion or arthritis of the big toe, um, and they do very well from that and, and don't have significant repercussions um, in terms of uh, pain and injury to the rest of their foot and ankle. And, uh, you know, gait studies have been done and shown that, you know, after a toe fusion, um, especially for toe arthritis, uh, the patients walk better than they, than they had walked uh, beforehand. Um, as a physical therapist, I appreciate uh, sharing this information, patient. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Also, any thoughts on PRP to treat cartilage in the foot and ankle? Um, I think same thing. I mean, there's no, um, again, no great data to show that PRP is going to regenerate cartilage. Um, uh, and but unfortunately, we also don't have any other means to uh, to regenerate normal articular cartilage. Uh, the treatments that we have basically um, uh, produce uh, fibrocartilage, which is uh, the next best thing we have available. Um, 
and I think PRP may have some anti-inflammatory properties and, and may um, help patients' comfort, so uh, I think probably does have a role, uh, but uh, we really don't have great evidence uh, for that, um, so it's hard to uh, make, a, make a solid re a recommendation on it. Uh, cause and treatment for plantar fasciitis. So I did go through some of the different treatments, again, largely um, uh, a non-surgical uh, non condition. Uh, as far as causes, um, you know, the main one that's been identified is a, uh, is a tight uh, calf muscle, um, and there's probably a component of uh, overuse involved as well. Is there anything that can be done for a diabetic neuropathy? Um, uh, the answer is, is yes. Um, <clears throat> there are some nerve medicines, and uh, as a foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon, I, um, I don't typically prescribe those, so I would I usually defer, uh, defer um, uh, prescribing those medicines to either a patient's primary doctor, a neurologist, or a pain, pain management doctor. Um, there's not really any surgical treatment for uh, diabetic neuropathy, though there are some um, surgical conditions that result from diabetic neuropathy that we treat. My ankles tend to cause me to lose my balance. Uh, what could this be? What would you recommend? <clears throat> so that could be a number of different things. It could be either from pain or from instability or the two issues um, that uh, potentially could be a, a structural issue uh, of the foot and ankle. And, and um, you know, like many of these things require a little bit more um, investigation with uh, you know, physical examination uh, and imaging studies. You know, foot and ankle is an interesting field uh, uh, and uh, one of the, the fun things about it is that the physical exam actually is very helpful um, in, in terms of examining people in the office, whereas some of the other uh, subspecialties rely more strictly on imaging or, or, or history. So, um, you know, I, I would have to give a little bit more information, but possibly uh, instability or, uh, or pain from a number of different conditions uh, could be the cause of, of this um, imbalance, and, uh, and we do have treatments for those depending on what it is. All right, I'm a 61-year-old male runner and have Achilles tendonitis. I had it several years ago and it did completely heal. Is it okay to still run a little bit if it doesn't hurt while actually running? The pain usually follows exercise, not during. I'm doing the recommended stretching, thank you. So uh, in general, it is safe to run. Um, uh, however, you know, I would let the uh, pain kind of, and including pain afterwards, kind of uh, tell you as to how much you're, you're able to do. You know, one thing people ask is, are they at risk of causing an Achilles tendon rupture if they have Achilles tendonitis? And um, a little bit depends on uh, what the actual condition of the tendon is. Um, you know, some patients have a bad tendinopathy, which are with a real thickened and degenerative tendon and are at a substantially higher risk of a rupture. Other people just have a little bit of inflammation at the tendon lining, and that probably is a minimal increased risk. But in general, if you have some pain in your Achilles, if you're tight and you're protecting it, and you're probably at increased risk of, of an Achilles rupture. Usually it takes a, a fall or an uh, attempt at a dynamic push-off to cause that, um, <clears throat> but, uh, but there is a slight increased risk of a rupture. Um, as far as continuing to run through it, you know, it may just cause things to, to stay aggravated. So I would work on trying to, you know, as you said, uh, devote yourself to the stretching exercises, even consider, you know, some formal, uh, formal therapy and then ease back into uh, running and, and ramp it up in a gradual manner. I'm 59, I walk three miles five days a week. I'm suffering uh, from pain on bottom uh, of midfoot and ball foot. Um, went to a, uh, another uh, doc and he gave me a cortisone shot on top of my foot uh, near the middle toe area 10 days ago. I, sorry. Um, I've had no relief. I have very high arch and told me not to wear any flat shoes. I just switched to Hoka sneakers to give me more cushion and lift. Not sure what else to do. So again, it, it sounds like um, you may have some uh, some arthritis uh, through the through the middle of the foot. Um, you know, one thing that uh, I'll often do for those um, is instead of doing the injections myself, I'll often refer people uh, to have them done under ultrasound guidance. Um, either at the hospital or, uh, or somewhere else because they're very small joints and unlike the knee or even the ankle, it's, it's hard to get, make sure it's in the right, the right spot. Um, so even though the injection didn't work the, that one time, there is still possibility that uh, it could be a candidate for injections. Um, again, this is kind of assuming that it's a, you know, a midfoot arthritis um, uh, condition. Um, 
Now, the next step after injections for, for midfoot arthritis um, is consideration of surgery, and uh, there's not a, a joint replacement for that. It would be a fusion of the, of the affected joints. That's for the wonderful lecture. Um, so happy with the repair of my right bunion hammer toes. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I have mild vascular insufficiency in my left lower leg. Uh, the calf of this leg has been stiff and painful on waking, and lately uh, I've had plantar fasciitis in the left heel. Right leg and foot are okay. Should I start with the vascular or orthopedic? Um, try and, so left side uh, has vascular issues and plantar fasciitis in the left heel. Um, so, I mean, uh, the vascular uh, issue is more concerning in general, you know. Um, so I would say start there because uh, having inadequate uh, blood flow to the leg, um, you know, especially if it's an arterial issue, uh, is a can be a concerning thing, and I and I would have that addressed. Whereas the plantar fasciitis is uh, again, you know, really not a um, serious or dangerous condition. Typically self-limited, and uh, and I would start with some some stretching exercises uh, for that. So. Um, no reason you can't get both uh, evaluated, but uh, I would have to say vascular wins in terms of the, uh, the importance. All right. Last summer, you conservatively treated my left avulsion fracture lateral malleolus, and three weeks ago, I was running and supinated and inverted uh, my right foot, and now I have intermittent pain between the fourth and fifth metatarsal plantar surface. I've torn a ligament. I've been wearing my cam boot, but, uh, but not consistently. So, um, so yeah, that could be an, an injury to the ligaments uh, of the metatarsal phalangeal joints uh, between the um, between the metatarsals and the toes, and uh, and I think your intuition is right in uh, in initially uh, trying to rest it in a boot um, uh, three weeks ago. So you know it's still somewhat early on, and uh, I think you know giving a, giving a period of, of treatment in that boot is appropriate. Uh, maybe a, maybe a few more weeks and seeing how things respond. Um, ultimately, if that doesn't Im improve, certainly I'd want to you know take a look at things myself and examine you. But maybe uh, maybe appropriate to get an MRI at that point to evaluate for a ligament injury. All right, I have uh, exercise-induced pain below my lateral, left lateral malleolus. Is this perineal tendonitis? Or are there exercises or orthotics that, <clears throat> that you would advise? Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that could quite possibly be perineal tendonitis. Uh, the per perineal tendons run uh, behind the lateral malleolus or, or distal fibula and curve right beneath it. Uh, so that is a common area where the tendons can get irritated. Also a common area where the tendons can get torn. Um, so I, I do think <clears throat> that, um, that some uh, exercises uh, to strengthen and, and stretch out the perineal tendons uh, would be effective. Um, oftentimes, uh, heel raise exercises, so standing at the counter, going up on your toes, uh, either with both legs initially or, or then with, uh, you know, with the involved side only, uh, can help to strengthen those muscles using a, a resistance band uh, to, um, uh, to, to work with strength uh, about those tendons is helpful. Um, and it, you know, it's often helpful to do some focused physical therapy to have a therapist, you know, at least uh, teach you the exercises and make sure you're doing them properly for one or two sessions before doing them on your own. Uh, as far as orthotics, kind of depends on the shape of the foot. There is um, one orthotic called the Don Joy Arch Rival that does kind of tilt you away from the lateral or the outer side of the, of the foot and ankle and uh, may be appropriate for you, but, um, uh, you know, would want to kind of uh, do more of an examination before uh, giving a lot of advice on that. How long is the recuperation for an ankle uh, replacement? Um, so typically, you know, and it, it does vary a little bit because often when we're doing an ankle replacement, there can be other uh, components of the uh, surgery uh, that can add to the recovery time. Uh, but usually uh, we allow for um, initiation of weight bearing at about the, the four week mark. So you're in a splint for about two weeks and then transitioning into uh, a boot once the skin's healed and starting to work on range of motion. Uh, weight bearing is typically started at about uh, four weeks and then uh, we start to transition you out of the boot, usually at around uh, eight weeks or so. Now, that's not to say the recovery is over and there's physical therapy involved. And really, people from most um, complex foot and ankle surgeries will continue to improve 
um, up to you know up to a year, and sometimes even between the first and second years. Quite quite honestly, but that's kind of a general overview of the of the rehab. Uh, what is the name of the ankle replacement that you use? Have you heard of the Zimmer total ankle replacement? I understand is put in from the side. I'm interested in the cadence total ankle replacement. How much physical therapy is involved after the total ankle replacement? So again, kind of getting into a little bit more of the high level details here. So um, it looks like you've, you've done some homework. So I do use the, the cadence total ankle replacement. Um, uh, I previously used the star total ankle replacement, particularly in training, but the cadence is a little bit of uh, a newer version uh, with some of the similar features. Um, the Zimmer is put it, placed in from the side, so it involves having to do a cut or an osteotomy of the fibula, and I, and I don't have any experience with that implant. Um, <clears throat> in terms of how much physical therapy is, is involved, um, usually we start with um, at least a, a six-week uh, course of physical therapy. Um, uh, starting, you know, at, at about the six-week mark, and then oftentimes we'll, you know, we'll prescribe an additional, uh, additional six-week course if needed. It's typically two times a week is the standard. All right, I think, uh, oh, got another one. Have arthritis gout with pain in the right uh, big toe. Also have bunion on the same foot. Uh, it's been very painful. X-ray shows some cartilage, uh, bone life. Um, uh, what would you suggest? So, <clears throat> so you know, with gout, um, th that can be a, a couple different uh, issues. So gout, you know, often has uh, very acute flare-ups that, that occur uh, intermittently. Um, and gout is mainly a, a medical uh, treatment that's treated with medicine. So either uh, anti-inflammatories when you're having a gout flare or uh, something called allopurinol to decrease the uric acid uh, in your body to prevent gout flare-ups. Now, the sequelae of having chronic gout can result in damage to the joint itself. And if you have that, as well as a bunion on that side, um, you, know, you may be a candidate for a, for a fusion of uh, of that joint, uh, a first MTP fusion. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, as far as non-surgical treatments, uh, you know, again, wearing good stiff supportive shoes, um, wearing uh, a shoe with a soft upper portion that's not, you know, pressing substantially against the toe. Um, there's one more that uh, looks like it didn't come through completely, so I'm not sure what uh, what uh, the question's getting at there. Um, anyone else have anything that I can? And I can answer. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, for attending. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Hopefully, it was uh, it was informative. And thanks for your, uh, your questions and attention. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Fuchs. Excellent. Have a good rest of the night. Good night.